Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to Blind Injustice with Donya Lee Drinks. I'm Donya Lee, and this is my drink. Hello, lover. Please ignore the 70s style bouffant thing I've got going on today. I'm still in a beach town, and my hair's not wanting to cooperate, so this is the best I could do. Sorry. If you've never been here before, we always salute our queen before getting started. If you have been here before, say it with me. All hail the queen. You'll probably see her again. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Danya. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also a certified legal nurse consultant, which allows me to have a foot in both the medical and the legal worlds, which I really love. One of my passions is the Innocence Project and the work that they do. If you're not familiar with the Innocence Project, go ahead and take a look at my first video. It will tell you a little bit about who they are, what they do, why I'm so passionate about it, and why I started this channel. Along with some scary statistics about your judicial system that will keep you up at night. On this channel, we talk about the wrongfully imprisoned who were exonerated by DNA evidence. Some of our cases take place where the exoneree was still in prison. Some of our cases take place where they were only posthumously exonerated, which means they were unjustly executed before being found innocent. We'll also talk about some current cases the Innocence Project is working on and how you can help. Today's case was originally going to be about a man named Orlando Cruz. But his case is so complicated and went so deep, there actually ended up being three exonerees. So that means we're going to have to dive deep on this one. Hang on to your seats, kids, because this one is a Lulu. Watch the first step. It's a Lulu. So grab whatever you're drinking and let's get started. This case begins with Janine Nicarico. Janine was born on July 7th, 1972 to Tom and Patricia Nicarico. She also had two older sisters, Chris and Kathy. They lived in Naperville, Illinois, close to the Aurora, Illinois line. They described Janine as a joy in their life with an infectious giggle and a loving and sensitive nature. On February 23rd, 1983, poor 10-year-old Janine had the flu and had to stay home from school. Now, in the 80s, most of us had uh, dual working parents. A lot of that's similar now. But it was almost unheard of for my parents, at least, to call in sick for any reason. They had to be practically on death's door or a death in the family. That generation just didn't call in sick for something as simple as their child being sick. So while her mom struggles with whether or not to stay home from work, Janine assures her that she's going to be fine. And like I said, it wasn't unusual for a sick 10 to 12 year old and up to be home alone if they were sick. As a matter of fact, Janine's last words to her mom were, don't worry, mom, I'll be okay. Janine's mom stops by there twice during the work day and calls her pretty much constantly and Janine's doing just fine. But when the family gets home at the end of the day, they find that the front door has been kicked in and Janine is gone. The only clue is a boot print on the front door. Unfortunately, Janine is found two days later in the woods. She's been raped and beaten to death. The autopsy would reveal that her skull had been crushed by blunt force trauma, later to be identified as a tire iron. She also has a broken nose, and swabs are taken from her mouth, vagina, and rectal areas. And this next part just really got me in the feels. They found fingernail drag marks on one of the walls inside her home. I can't imagine her terror. I also can't imagine being her parents living in a home that's got their daughter's fingernail drag marks on one of the walls. But as a mom, I would be so proud of her for clearly putting up a fight. Each of her sisters would get married in later years, and they would stop by the cemetery and put a bridesmaid bouquet on her grave. Both of the sisters did this when they got married. The family moved away shortly after the crime, and I can't say I blame them one bit. 
Rolando Cruz was born in 1963, and he was 20 at the time of the crime. He was also a gang member in Aurora, Illinois. He'd been in some scrapes with the police, but it was mostly minor stuff. Alejandro Hernandez is also in a rival neighborhood, and he is about 19 at the time of the crime. Um, he's also been in some trouble with the police, but again, very minor petty stuff, just misdemeanors. After Janine is murdered, a $10,000 reward is put out for anybody with information about her killer. And this is a huge controversy in the justice system now. Offering rewards doesn't hardly ever lead to the actual killer and brings out all kinds of people in the woodwork. And it usually just distracts from the investigation. It doesn't ever actually help the investigation. So there's a lot of controversy about rewards. And in this case, the reward itself ended up sending two men to death row. So Alejandro hears about this reward and he goes to the DuPage County Police Department. DuPage County is where all of this takes place and I will never forget DuPage County as long as I live. You'll see why by the end of the video. Anyway, he goes into the DuPage County Police Department with some lame story about this dude named Ricky Benavides and how he was talking to people about the murder. Well, the police can't find this Ricky Benavides guy because he doesn't exist. So Alejandro drops two other names, Mike Castro and Steve Buckley. He said they were with Ricky Benavides when he confessed to the crime. In the meantime, Rolando Cruz gets the same bright idea about this reward, and he too goes into the DuPage County Police Department and whips up some lame-ass 20-year-old story that he thinks is going to stick and get him the reward. What had happened was... Unbeknownst to him, what it does do is arouse suspicion. This interview is recorded, and that's going to be important later, so don't forget that. So the police know it's kind of BS and it causes them to suspect him because they think maybe he's using his story to throw the police off of himself. The police can't find this Mike Castro guy either, but, but they do find Stephen Buckley and they show him a picture of the boot print. And these guys are young, right? So Steve goes, oh my gosh, I have a pair of boots exactly like that. Oh, Steve. So the police promptly march him to his home and he gets his mom to bring out the boots that are similar and the police take them as evidence. The police bring Rolando Cruz back for another interview on May 10th. This interview is also recorded. And again, this is important. So from May of 83 to March of 84, the police get busy, really busy. Not doing detective and police work, of course, because we've seen this time and time again, right? They've got the people that they want to hang for the crime, so now they've got to jerry-rig it and reverse engineer it all to make these guys guilty. And that's what they do. Now, at the time of the investigation for this whole year, Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley don't even know that the others are on, under suspicion. I don't even think they know that they're under suspicion, but they don't know that the other ones are under suspicion as well. Rolando Cruz and Alejandro Hernandez are acquainted, but they do come from rival neighborhoods, so they are not friends. And neither of them are acquainted at all with Stephen Buckley. They have no idea that they or the others have implicated themselves with the police. So they're just going about life. On March 8th of 1984, Rolando Cruz, Alejandro Hernandez, and Stephen Buckley are all indicted on the following charges. Murder, burglary, home invasion, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated indecent liberties, deviant sexual assault, and can I just say, is there really any other kind of sexual assault? Isn't sexual assault in and of itself deviant behavior? Just saying. And rape as well. Aside from the statements that the police say that they have where the guys implicate themselves, they also claim to have witnesses. And then one of the detectives says that Rolando came back in on May 9th and made this kind of a dream sequence statement about a dream he had, supposedly. And he said in this dream statement that Cruz revealed things that only the killer would know. This would end up being completely fabricated. Never happened. 
How do we know that it never happened? Well, the other two interviews were recorded, right? Was this one recorded? No. Is there any kind of written statement anywhere about this interview? No, of course not. Didn't happen. All they have is the testimony of this detective. But the police can be trusted, right? Especially if they're testifying in court, right? They're held without bond and the trial begins in January of 1985. It lasts about seven weeks. Buckley was the only one fortunate enough to have his own attorney. They decide to try Cruz and Hernandez together. So they arrive for trial, and Cruz looks at his attorney and said, who, who are those guys? And the attorney said, well, those are your co-defendants. And Cruz said, what's a co-defendant? And his attorney just looks at him and said, these are the two guys that you supposedly committed the crime with. And like I said, Cruz knows Hernandez, but not well, and he's never even met Buckley. So he's completely astonished by this, especially when he finds out he's being tried with Hernandez. Let's start with Buckley. So Buckley's whole case hinges on this boot print, right? And oh my gosh, what a cluster F this is. Buckley's boots are sent to a DuPage County shoe examiner, and he states that the shoes are not a match. He's about to write his report, but talks to the assistant state attorney first to be a phone. And that state attorney says, I don't want you talking about this evidence and do not write the report. Doesn't give him any reasons as to why. That's all he has to say. However, he would testify later that the assistant state attorney, Thomas Knight, had asked him to suppress the evidence. We'll talk about that later. Now, why would the assistant state attorney ask him to do this? Well... We've seen this time and time again, right? It doesn't match their narrative. They've decided these guys are guilty. So if they have evidence that state that it, he's not, they're not interested in that. And do you know what else they're not interested in? Handing it over to the defense. So now we've got a what on our hands? Maybe we can use it a trial Brady violation. A Brady violation. If you don't know what a Brady violation is, that means you haven't watched any of the other videos. And shame on you. Go back and do it. So this night guy goes ahead and sends the boot print and the boots to the Illinois State shoe examiner. And he also says, dude, it's not a match. So they've got two shoe examiners that are both saying this is not your guy. And the prosecution just doesn't want any part of that. They're just suppressing the evidence. Finally, they send the boots and the print evidence to a woman who's known as the shoe examiner from hell. And trust me, she's earned that. She has gone all over the country speaking to investigators, doing public speaking on how shoe prints are as absolutely as individual as fingerprints are and can be totally determinative in a guilty situation. She claims that she can even tell the height and weight of a perpetrator by his shoe print. Now, generally speaking, I see why this makes sense, right? Because, you know, if especially if you're a runner, you get this either pronate or supinate. Um, you know, some people have duck feet, some people turn in, some of us heel strike more, some of us have our weight on our toes more. So we all do have individual shoe wear to a point, I wouldn't say it's as individual as a fingerprint, and I sure as hell wouldn't want to go to prison based on how I wear my shoes. This woman's name is Louise Robbins. And at the time of the trial, she already has one wrong conviction under her belt. But does that stop DuPage County? Of course not, because she's telling them exactly what they want to hear, right? I'm sure she's being paid to do so, too. So she tells them that, yes, it's a match. This is the guy who did it. Based on his wear prints, this guy, these boots, and this print are a match. This would later be referred to as the Cinderella effect. And be completely debunked. Her work is now considered totally meritless and trash science. Now Buckley's attorney, he knows a dude from the FBI. And you might recognize this guy. His name is William Botsniak, and he was a shoe print examiner on the O.J. Simpson trial. 
So Buckley's attorney knows this guy and he sends the shoes to be examined by this FBI agent. So that, that looks really good, right? Wrong. When Botsniak gets the boots, he can see that there's ink on them, so he knows they've been examined by another lab before, and he says the FBI doesn't do that. If they're not the initial examiner, they do not re-examine evidence. And I can understand that to a point, because there can be all kinds of contamination going on. Um, there's no chain of custody for the evidence. I get why they wouldn't want to be a part of that, so he refuses. He's like, I'm not going to examine these shoes. But the evidence is still pretty conflicting. I mean, Candace testifies to the prosecution point, but her theories are pretty out there. And so it results in a hung jury. So since there's a hung jury, that means Buckley's going to get another trial. So his attorney really starts putting the pressure on this Botsnack guy to please look at this evidence. Otherwise, this guy might go to prison based on Candace's testimony, and that would really be a travesty. So Botsnack finally breaks down and looks at the boots and looks at the pattern and says they're not even close. As a matter of fact, if you look on the heels, the arcs go in completely different directions. Like the shoes have an arc that go like this on the heel, but the prints have an arc that go like this on the heel. And the sizes aren't the same either. So the FBI agent is like, nope. And that's all the judge needs to hear. They don't even hold a second trial and Buckley's exonerated. So he's good. Now all while this is going on, one of the DuPage County investigators named John Sam is taking a look at all this evidence, trying to prepare for the upcoming trial of Cruz and Hernandez. That's his job. And he starts looking at all this so-called evidence and he sees that they've got a problem. Hold up. These guys are innocent. He knows it. So he calls the assistant state attorney and says, we've got a problem here. I think these guys are innocent. And the assistant attorney tells him to keep his mouth shut and do his job, that they're going to court. So what does John Sam do? I quit. He quits. He quits and he tells everybody he knows about all of the stuff he found or better yet didn't find. He tells the press, he won't keep his mouth shut. He's telling everybody that will listen, these guys are innocent. Walks off his job and makes sure everybody knows why. Hey, extra, extra, read all about it. So he's hero number one in this case. So now Cruz and Hernandez's trial starts and up come these witnesses. Yes. Let's talk about these witnesses. Witnesses? An informant. I mean, uh, informants. There's a guy named Stephen Ford who shared a cell with Cruz while they were being held over for trial. And he comes up to testify and he's supposed to make this big testimony against Cruz. And he kind of waters it down and says he can't remember exactly what Cruz said about the crime, but that he knows he was involved. He would later testify that he was under threat of death from Cruz if he testified, which is why he didn't give more detailed information. This would end up being total bullshit, which we'll find out later on. Then there's this other guy that he did time with in county while he was being held over, who said that he had confessed to him that he and Hernandez and Buckley had broken to the Naperville home, took the little girl, brought her to a drug house in Aurora, and raped and killed her there because she could identify them. And then there's another guy named Dan Fowler who said that he spoke to Cruz back in 1983 who said that Cruz mentioned being involved in the child abduction and murder. But that Cruz had insisted he hadn't killed the child. He also identified the weapon of the crime as being a baseball bat. He would end up being impeached because of his inconsistent testimony. Now, all of this is going on, and you're thinking about these poor men that are going through all of this. But think about her parents. They had to sit through Buckley's trial. Now they're sitting through this trial with all these false witnesses that are talking about their daughter and a baseball bat. All of the witnesses would deny receiving anything in return for their testimony, and we will talk a little bit about that later. But just keep in mind that convicts don't tend to do things out of the kindness of their heart especially when they themselves are already doing time. 
The DuPage County Sheriff's Department also stated that they had a canine unit on the crime scene, and the canine indicated that there was more than one assailant at the crime scene. This actually breaks Illinois law. In Illinois, canine markings cannot be submitted as evidence in any case. So they broke the law when they provided this evidence in court. Now, I don't know why Cruz and Hernandez's attorney didn't object to that based on the illegality, or maybe he did and he was overruled, which would be pretty much in par for these cases, right? And if it's possible anywhere, it's possible in this county. Welcome to Hazard County. So was there any serological or hair evidence in the case? Yes, there was. Did any of that evidence tie Cruz and Hernandez to the case? No, it didn't. Do the prosecutors or judge or jury care about that? Well, of course they don't, because we see this over and over again. They don't care that, they, yes, we have evidence here. No, it doesn't tie these men to the crime. So no, it doesn't matter. Because on March 15th, 1985, Cruz and Hernandez are found guilty and sentenced to death by the judge. This was a bench trial, meaning it was only a judge and not a jury. And again, I'm not sure why Cruz and Hernandez's attorney, because he was actually a decent attorney. We'll talk about that later, too. I'm not sure why he didn't have Cruz and Hernandez exercise their right to a jury trial, unless he thought the crime was so emotional that the jury wouldn't be able to be objective which could be the case. Um, but in any case, the judge wasn't objective either because he found them guilty and sentenced them to death. One of the things I really respected about these guys is like they're rival gangs, right? And they don't even really know this Buckley guy. And through this whole thing, the prosecution, you know how they like to try to divide and conquer, compare stories, put pressure on people. So this whole time, the prosecutor's office, the DuPage County, is trying to put pressure on each of them to roll over on the other in order for a lighter sentence for themselves. None of them do it. None of them are even tempted to do it. They keep their mouths shut. They don't say anything against the other guys. They all stick to what they know to be true, and that's that they're innocent. Now, if I was facing the death penalty and you put some pressure on me to maybe admit to something I didn't do, roll over on somebody else so I could get off of death row, that would probably be a pretty tempting carrot. I would like to think I wouldn't do it, but I certainly wouldn't blame someone who did because that's a terrifying thought. So they're sent to death row in two different places and Cruz would be in death row next to this guy named Dickie Gaines. And he said Dickie Gaines was just instrumental in teaching him all kinds of things that he needed to know in order to get through this. He said he saved his life in a lot of ways and gave him a lot of really good advice. Get busy living, you get busy dying. He told him to study the law for himself and take his case in his own hands because there was nobody out there that wanted to help him get off death row as much as he wanted to get off death row himself. So that's what Cruz did. He learned a lot about the law, um, helped his attorney file his own briefings, his own appeals, and that was really good. However, because he ended up knowing so much, he and his attorney would often go toe to toe and argue about strategy. Okay, so first things first, DuPage County had violated their right to a fair trial by trying them together. In January of 1989, the appellate court would look at that and also some prosecutorial misconduct, namely the canine unit, and they would grant Cruz a new trial. So yay, right? He gets a second trial. So his new trial starts in 1990, and that's five years later. He's been on death row for five years. And in that five years, some pretty interesting evidence has come up. A man named Brian Dugan, who was in prison already for the sexual assault and murder of both a woman and an eight-year-old girl, came forward and tells his attorney, hey, those two guys in prison, they're doing my time, and that he had committed this crime alone. Well, of course, this is privileged information, so his attorney isn't allowed to reveal it to anyone, which is frustrating for both Brian Dugan and the attorney. Now this guy might be a serial rapist and a serial killer, 
but I guess he's got some kind of moral code of conduct that he did not want these two men to be on death row for something he did, especially since he's already serving three life sentences. Like, this guy's got nothing to lose at this point, right? The attorney is able to find a workaround. It turns out if you're talking about plea-related subjects, you can reveal that information to the prosecutor's office, but it can't be used against you in court. So they turn this whole conversation, confession, around to relate to a plea deal. And in that way, Dugan's attorney is able to bring it to the prosecution, the DuPage County prosecution. So do we think that's going to make a difference? The way the law works is really weird. Okay, you could talk about this, and I can't tell anybody, but you can talk about this exact same thing in the exact same words, and we'll put it under this column here, and now you can talk about it all you want, and it can't be used against you in the court of law. It's like the IRS. And it's important that this information can't be used against Dugan in court because he's doing three life sentences. But as we already know, at this point in the case, Illinois has the death penalty. So he's got three life sentences, but he doesn't want to go on death row and die. Dugan's attorney brings this information to the DuPage County Sheriff's Office, and they just don't care. Dugan even tells them that he had to kick in the door three times in order to get it to bust down, which should have been evident by the boot prints. But the DuPage County Sheriff's Office dismisses it. So even though the prosecution has this information and can't use it against him in court, it is still considered privileged information, which means Dugan's attorney can't share this information with Cruz and Hernandez's attorney, which he really wants to do. He knows the attorney. He knows these guys are innocent, but he's unable to tell what he knows. So instead, he'd take the guy to lunch. They'd be having some casual chit chat. He'd be like, hey, did you hear the rumor about the new evidence that's been dug up on the Nicarico case? And just leave it at that. And that was this guy's tip to go to the prosecution to see what they had that they weren't disclosing. Because by law, the Brady law, they're supposed to disclose the evidence. But we all know DuPage County by this point, and they're not disclosing squat unless he goes and asks for it. So that's how he finds out that we already know the killer. Dugan's confessed. It's right in his alley, totally his M.O. We know that Dugan is the killer. So the prosecution is now preparing for the second trial. And now they've got a confession by Dugan that Cruz and Hernandez's defense team now knows about. So now they have to change tactics, right? They have to change their strategy. So their new strategy was that Cruz and Hernandez were with Dugan when this crime was committed and that Dugan killed her, but that Cruz performed the sexual assault. And of course, the <clears throat> witnesses come back. This time, that Ford guy, he testifies that Cruz said he kind of killed a girl. I don't know how you kind of kill a girl from Naperville, Illinois, and that he hadn't given that testimony in the first trial because Cruz threatened to kill him. He would later testify that multiple burglary charges would be dropped in exchange for this testimony. There's a prosecuting attorney named Robert Kalander who is prosecuting these two, and years later he would end up testifying on behalf of one of the other witnesses talking about how cooperative he was in the Cruz case in order to get the charges lessened for him. So yeah, these witnesses had nothing to gain at all. Something smells fishy. Both at the first and second trial, Cruz had alibi witnesses. And then in the second trial, he's got Dugan's confession. But to no avail. Cruz is sentenced to death again. Want to know why? Because the judge from the first trial is also the judge for the second trial. But even before the verdict was read, Cruz told his mom he knew he was going to be found guilty and he would let them execute him before he was going to admit to something he didn't do. 
And by now, this Dugan confession, it's gotten around to the reporters. Everybody kind of knows that this whole case is starting to look super suspicious and that these guys are innocent. The whole public opinion is starting to turn that way. So when he is found guilty a second time, there was a news reporter in the courtroom with tears streaming down her face while she was shaking her head no. So Cruz is sent back to prison, but he doesn't give up. He stays really updated on the law and starts reading about DNA because now DNA is kind of coming into the picture. Definitely not in the forefront yet, but it there's enough out there that he can read on it. So he starts talking about this to his attorney, but like I said, this is brand new and his attorney is telling him, this doesn't look good. This is not the way to go. But Cruz insists. But he also wants to try to expand his legal team. He knows the more people he's got fighting for him, especially with the science to back him up, that his chances are better. And why does he know this? It's because he's been doing all this legal reading. So he and his attorney sit down and they start investigating different attorneys and how they might help in this case. And they make a list of attorneys. And one of them just happens to be working for the Medill Innocence Project at Northwestern University. So they write him. And just about everyone they write joins this team and decides to take on his case. And they not only agree to be part of the legal team, they also agree with Cruz about the DNA evidence. Enter Attorney General Mary Bridget Kenny, Attorney General for the state, meaning she's with the prosecution or she's supposed to be. Of course, Cruz has a filed an appeal to his second guilty verdict, right? Because that's his right, it's his right to appeal. So Mary is tasked with finding prosecutorial evidence to fight this appeal. She reviews the case and then she immediately calls the Illinois Attorney General. He's the Attorney General for the entire state. And she's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold up. There is so much prosecutorial misconduct, investigator misconduct. These guys are innocent. We can't try them. We need to let them go. And the attorney general pretty much tells her, stay in your lane. That's not your job. Your job is to do what I tell you to do. And I'm telling you to get some evidence to fight this appeal. What does Mary Bridget Kenny do? I quit. She quits on the spot. She's like, if you and your appeal, I'm quitting. And I also am going to go out there and tell reporters and everybody I know what's going on hey extra extra read all about it and for somebody who was working for the state that could actually be incredibly dangerous for her but she does it and she states later that before he was exonerated she always would just fight herself at night just be awake at night wondering if she should have done more if she could have done more but she was really afraid for her own safety at this point for doing as much as she did. So she's our hero number two. She would later receive the Profiles in Courage Award for this. What does she do now? She works to support abused and neglected minors, and she also works with disabled adults. Aww. Now while all of this drama is going on, the DNA has come back, and of course it's exonerated both Cruz and Hernandez. So we've got DNA that does not match Cruz does not match Hernandez, does match Dugan. We've got a confession from Dugan. But what do the prosecutors decide? They decide to go forward with a third trial because, of course, all of that evidence, the second appeal is granted. I mean, no brainer, right? Corruption can go as far as like a county, but it would take multi levels of people to be like pushing all of that down. So his second appeal is granted, and instead of just exonerating them and letting them go, which should be pretty obvious by now, the prosecutor just, prosecution's digging their heels in. DuPage County is digging their heels in. Because by now, the levels of corruption run so deep, what are they going to do? Just admit they invented this whole case, pretty much? They can't do that, right? So before you lie about lying, about lying, about lying, about lying... So they decide they're going to go forward with a third trial. This time, there's just been so much going on. This time, it has to go to the Illinois Supreme Court. What a waste of everybody's time. 
for real. So prosecution's super overconfident because, you know, they've won the last two trials. They don't care how much evidence there is. They're, they're going to win again. But the defense comes across doozy evidence. I mean, they find some evidence that the detective... Remember this whole dream sequence, semi-confession thing that there was no recording of, no written statement about? The defense finds out that the DuPage County detective that testified to this information was in Florida at the time that this happened on May 9th. Florida? So they ask for a sidebar. They present the judge with this evidence. He takes a bit of a recess. He comes out. He puts the detective on the stand, presents him with the evidence, and asks him to testify about that evidence versus his earlier statement about the confession on May 9th. Well, what can the detective do? He's totally busted. So he confesses that it was a false claim, that none of that was ever true, and he's charged with perjury as well. He should be. So he's impeached on the spot, and the dominoes start to fall. The judge doesn't even let the defense present their case. He is all over the prosecutorial shenanigans and he immediately exonerates Cruz on November 3rd, 1995. And two months later, Hernandez would be exonerated as well. It takes until 2002, seven years later, for them to be completely pardoned by the Illinois state governor. Let's go ahead and fast forward now because we've got DNA evidence and a confession by Duke and that he's the killer, right? So now all of this Cruz Hernandez stuff is over. It's time to bring Duke to trial. So he goes on trial with his confession and the DNA evidence, and he is found guilty and sentenced to death. He details the crime on the stand, stating that Janine did, in fact, leave those fingerprint scratches on the wall as he dragged her out of her home, that he took her to the woods to sexually assault her. He was going to let her go, but a switch flipped inside of him, and he decided he couldn't, and he takes a tire iron and beats her to death. And her poor parents have to sit through all of this again. So it's in 2009 that he's sentenced to death. So it took seven years for him to actually be tried and prosecuted. So I'm not sure why it took that long, but I'm not surprised either. It probably took years to wade through all that prosecutorial corruption to even build a case. So let's talk about Brian Dugan for a second. Um, Brian was born in 1956 to two alcoholic parents. And back then, giving birth, the whole birthing process was very different. It was practically medieval. So his mom goes into a really rapid labor, and there's not enough time for the doctor to get there. So what do they do? They take that baby's head, and they shove it back up into the birth canal, and then they tie his mother's legs together until the doctor could get there. So, of course, there is some question as to whether that may have caused some brain damage to him. And even his siblings think that it did because all through his childhood and teen years, he would suffer from these awful headaches and have all this vomiting. He was a chronic bedwetter, but apparently his dad was too. When he was eight, he talks his brother into helping him burn down the garage. Um, His brother said that when he was, when Dugan was 13, he poured gasoline on a cat and lit it on fire. And one time after coming back from a group home as a teenager, Dugan tried to molest his brother. And his brother said he was pretty sure that Dugan had been molested at the group home. In 1974, when Dugan was 18, he attempted to kidnap a 10-year-old from a train station. But for some reason, those charges would later be dropped. And as previously stated, he was already serving three life sentences for those other two crimes as well. Here are Dugan's three victims. His death sentence, his death sentence was commuted to life without parole in March of 2011 when the Illinois governor overturned the death penalty. Guess who was instrumental in helping him make that happen? 
Kirk Bloodsworth. Remember him? If you don't remember him, that means you probably didn't watch the video. Go do that. Okay, so let's talk compensation. Cruz would get a whole $120,300 from the state of Illinois for spending all that time on death row. Alejandro Hernandez, for some reason, gets like $170,000. I find this absolutely reprehensible after everything that they have been through and the level of corruption that was part of this investigation. I get that that's not necessarily the state's problem, but the state is in charge of all these other jurisdictions. So this actually happened on the state's watch as well, not just DuPage County. So Hernandez and Cruz go on to sue DuPage County, which they absolutely should do. And the county settles for $3.5 million in the year 2000. Now I'm really happy that they get this money and it will help them start a new life. But money does not heal scars. And money is not justice. So they went on to try to get justice as well. In 1996, a DuPage County grand jury would indict what would be known as the DuPage Seven. This was a lieutenant, three DuPage County sheriffs, and three prosecutors. They were facing charges of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and perjury. Of course, they were acquitted in trial in 1999. Why? Because prosecutors hate prosecuting prosecutors. And do you know why else? Because even though the corruption ran so deep in this county, do you know where they tried this case? DuPage County. Nobody moved for a change of venue. I have no idea how that even happened. They absolutely should have been tried in a county, maybe not even in the state. But the trial takes place in DuPage County, which almost ensures acquittal. No disbarment, no penalties, nada. Full acquittal. And then it gets even worse. There were a bunch of the jury members. Now they get a jury trial, not a bench trial. But a bunch of the jury members waited around after all the, you know, red tape is done after the trial and go to a steak restaurant with the defendants to help them celebrate their acquittal until like the wee hours of the next morning. Yeah, nobody was paid there. So where is Rolando now? Rolando Cruz travels all over the place and tells his story. He still gets so tearful in multiple places when he does it. I watched him speak and was so moved by the fact that he just continually breaks down in his story, even though he's told it like hundreds of times, it was just so traumatizing and just so wrong. But here's what he says about what happened to him. He says, what happened to me was not a bad thing, but a great thing because I could withstand it. And I think that it's pretty amazing. He realizes that if somebody else had been in his position, they might not have been able to withstand all that. And he knows his case has directly freed others. He just realizes somebody else may not have been able to fight that hard. And his coach, Dickie Gaines, the one from Death Row, he passed away from cancer in 2017. He was not innocent, but he still was not a bad man. And just to give you a sense of how deep law enforcement entitlement goes. When the DuPage seven were acquitted, this is what the judge said. I shit you not. No methods can be considered too extreme because those forces are the thin line that separates society from uncivilized criminals. No methods can be considered too extreme there, ladies and gentlemen, lies everything that is wrong with our criminal justice system to date. Innocent until proven guilty? I don't think so. That's all for today, kids. 
Don't forget to go back and check on any episodes that you might have missed and watch those. Um, they kind of build on each other as we go sometimes. Also, if you're enjoying those videos, please hit subscribe for me. I would really appreciate it. If you would like to do your part, consider having your DNA taken by like a service like 23andMe and uploading it to GEDmatch. GEDmatch uses DNA to build genealogy trees. So that means sometimes in a criminal case, they'll get like a partial DNA strand or like a partial match. And if they have these genealogy trees, they can find people that the perpetrator may be related to and trace the tree from there to find the actual perpetrator, which I think is pretty cool. They don't do, use your DNA for any other reason. Um, it's just strictly used for building these trees and solving crimes. I did it and I thought it was pretty cool. No, I don't want to be related to Norman Bates. But if I am, I want him caught. It's a whole Norman Bates thing. I'm also a proud donor to the Innocence Project. They have to run all of these DNA tests and pay all of these attorneys, court fees, etc. And they're strictly non-profit, so they pay for all of that out of pocket. They really count on donors for that. Please go to their website, which I've left in the comments, and take a look around. Clearly, you can see from these videos, they can use all the help they can get. And until next time, be kind, don't be a Karen, and stay in your lane. Love you, K. Bye.